the issues of the building quality and how much money it will cost us to maintain buildings over time and enrollment trends in individual areas of the city. And based on that, they made a series of recommendations. And those recommendations will be taken into account as will an awful lot of other information. As we produce, it will probably be a maybe two to three year sequenced plan um, to bring the district's facilities more in line with the district's population. Um, we are not in the same situation we were in four years ago. We're facing this looming, gigantic budget crisis. Um, we do, however, need to uh, be careful with our dollars because our job is to educate children, not to run uh, unnecessary numbers of facilities. But um, we have more time for input. We have more time for careful deliberation. And we have more time for sequencing. Now, what do I mean by that? Last time, um, we still had a number of uh, very large, comprehensive middle schools. Uh, we're in one right now, that used to be. Um, they were not achieving. Uh, the results were very unacceptable. Um, what we did then, this was Columbus, Knoxville, the Lions, Reisenstein. Um, we would, what we did then, we would not do again, which is we closed them in one fell swoop and took a lot of K-5s and turned them to K-8s, like that. Um, what we would do, um, very much more likely next time, this time, is let a K-5, if it indeed is going to be a K-8, grow a year at a time into a K-8. It's a lot easier, a lot less stress on kids, um, a lot um, better way to do it, as long as you have the time and the luxury of that. Um, I was also asked, you know, because this is about input, are there non-negotiables? There are a few non-negotiables. Um, one is we are going to have to consolidate <coughs> facilities. So this is about timing, which facilities, and how it will be done. Um, we do not have the option of continuing to run um, facilities that are as underutilized as ours are. Um, and then there's some things that remain obvious, and even if they're debatable, I'll just give you an example. Um, Westinghouse High School is extremely under-enrolled, um, but Westinghouse High School also had a $30 million renovation um, five years ago. Whether that was advised or ill-advised, doesn't matter how it was done. So it would take an awful lot for us to believe that Westinghouse High School should be taken offline as a building. Okay? So, um, I didn't say that it's impossible, but it would be highly unlikely because the building is a fine facility, very recently upgraded, can be maintained for the next long number of years at very little cost. Um, <coughs> that's kind of an example of something that would be very um, surprising uh, to us. Uh, in another part of the city, um, Langley. Um, it's another building that is air conditioned. Um, is in, it needs a roof, but it was online to get a roof at a certain time. It would be highly unlikely for a variety of reasons that we would want to take Langley offline. So there are a number of those, and we can get into those <coughs> later. And it doesn't mean that they're out of the question actions, but it would take a huge amount of evidence and input to overcome the sort of obvious advantages to the district of keeping those buildings in use for one grade configuration program or another. Um, timing, I'll just say, we can't really tell you exactly the timing. Um, we will be working with this series of recommendations and, and bringing in other things. I would, I would guess that whatever we propose for September of 10 next year um, will be um, relatively, uh, there won't be very many proposals that we might move to the board for that period of time. Um, there may be a couple. Um, and there may be a couple that are driven by just overwhelming obviousness. And that would be where they're combinations of very low enrollment, very low performance, 
and um, not very much um, argument against. They would have to be sort of what would come close to being a no-brainer. Now, in this world of school closings, a no-brainer is not an easy thing to say because, you know, if, if your child is in a school um, and that school is near you, you care about it. So, um, I don't think there'd be very many that fit that category, but there may be a couple of actions. So, most likely, the majority of actions will be recommended for September of 2011 and September of 2012, um, and maybe some the year thereafter. So I will hand it over to our um, Chief of Operations, Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Burdnick. He will run through the presentation, and then we are all here to answer your questions in the format that the committee has designed. Mr. Burdnick. Good evening. Uh, it's great to be back. We enjoyed our, our, our time with the uh, budget presentation when we were with you last. We just have a few slides, and we're going to go through these quickly because we want to spend most of our time this evening with questions and answers and gathering your input. A um, little bit of an overview on the facility study. Um, the, uh, Dion was hired in January uh, to develop a 10-year plan. We looked at 76 school buildings, including six early childhood centers and five closed facilities. Took a look at enrollment. Uh, and also uh, provided a relative uh, estimation of what project costs would be to make buildings as though they were new. And it just gives you a relative sense of what the magnitude of a project would be. Buildings were looked at uh, in terms of various conditions. One was the physical plant itself. What are your windows like? What's your HVAC? Everything was scored uh, from new to uh, in need of replacement. Same thing with site analysis. The, uh, a look at conditions of like the parking lot and the driveway. Uh, other analysis incorporated into the ranking of buildings were environmental factors, uh, building configuration, code compliance, uh, and then the study also included 10-year enrollment projections, which uh, will show some summary slides, and then recommendations for us. So if you sort of think of a school, um, you have your facility condition, you have your enrollment, the number of students, uh, there's a couple of pieces missing in that equation, and that's some of the work that, that we're about to see. Some of the challenges of our building, um, our reality is that most of our buildings in Pittsburgh were built before uh, energy conservation, uh, before computers, uh, before uh, special education students were actually educated in comprehensive schools. Uh, all kinds of things, even uh, many of our schools where we have cafetoriums, for instance, uh, they were typically built before students ate lunch at school. We often get the question about how enrollment projections are done. So I, what I would ask you to think about is, uh, it's called a cohort survival method. So if 20 students are in a kinder, or 25 students are in a kindergarten class, just as an example, what you would look at would be historically in that school, how many students, what percentage of students move from kindergarten to first grade and then to second grade. And that project, uh, that method over time using historical trends at a building and at a district level uh, will give you reasonable assurance on, on what the number of students will be. It's been a challenge the last six years. We've lost um, 6,000 students. Much of it, um, what we have, uh, what we've experienced, uh, say, in the last six years was decline in, in the elementary and the middle grades. That's now working its way through our high schools. What DeYoung provided for us, um, if you look at, at the projection, uh, see the K-12 line, uh, we're sitting at the end of last year at uh, 26.6. Uh, as a result of Pittsburgh Promise, in part, uh, we begin to reach a steady state right around 22,000 students in the school district. So to summarize, uh, the receipt of the report is a first step. That gives you two uh, legs on a four-legged stool. The work that we're about, part of the input this evening, is the discussion around uh, the academic, the budgetary perspective uh, to tie into facilities in a whole. So our goal is to produce a plan uh, to align spending on buildings with a long-term vision for educational excellence. And uh, what we want to do is continue to make good progress on our academic and financial situation by carefully and think thinking through with a lot of input from parents and the community around which buildings will house which programs. I don't think it comes as a shock that underutilized schools consume resources. 
So even a very even a highly energy efficient building uh, with too few students will have a high cost per pupil uh, for no reason other than there just aren't enough uh, students in the building. Uh, so that can consume um, that that can put dollars in your budget in places that you'd rather not spend them if you can avoid it. The De Young study uh, puts uh, recommendations into four categories. Uh, the first is a discontinuation. The second is a, a score facility uh, change, meaning that you close the building and use it for another purpose would be an example. Uh, adjusting boundaries, like redrawing the streets that feed a particular school. And the last is a grade change uh, recommendation. I believe we had one or two of those. In sum total, uh, the recommendations were to close 16 facilities, uh, which would reduce our excess capacity from a little more than 10,000 students to a little more than 7,000. It would impact 35 current schools and two early childhood centers. Important, I would point out that the career technical recommendation coming from DeYoung was to continue to deliver uh, career technical services in our, in our comprehensive high schools or where uh, theme-based magnets uh, house CTE programs. Um, career technical is something we'll be looking at uh, in the coming months. Um, and Pete, I think here we just wanted to emphasize that we, that's a uh, decision on going out of plan as part of this year's uh, goals for the superintendent. Uh, the next couple of slides, uh, we simply pulled from uh, the, the, the right-sizing as a possible list of criteria that perhaps could help to add a lens beyond what the facility is or the enrollment or the budgetary impact. Um, and you can look at them at your leisure. That's not to say that those are the criteria that would necessarily be applied, they're meant to be illustrative. Uh, one of the things that the steering committee asked asks us to do in terms of um, making the case uh, for school reductions uh, was to take a look at the budgetary situation, so we just wanted to provide a couple of quick slides to update you. Um, the current outlook on 2009 is about a $5 million deficit by 1231. In our 2010 uh, budget, around $9 million. And the preliminary budget, which will be released Tuesday evening, um, is actually uh, roughly a million dollars less than last year's budget. We have, had, uh, we have reduced the budget by about $4 million since 2005 in grand total, um, which is pretty remarkable given some of the inflation and certain cost factors. Quick projection on what happens over time as a result of the current outlook. As you can see the challenges uh, continue to mount for the school district uh, through 2011. Driven by uh, really two things. The first is the end of the stimulus dollars, uh, which the Commonwealth used to uh, backfill the basic education subsidy. That ends in two years, and that creates a funding cliff of nearly $19 million when it ends. And a year later, uh, we have the impact of the um, school retirement system. Uh, we need additional funding. We put those two together, it creates about a $33 million challenge uh, within a 24-month period. So that's the backdrop. And we wanted to get through these slides as quickly as possible um, and take any questions and begin the discussion <coughs> around facilities. Can you provide the rationale for closing a low-performing school 
rather than increasing resources to focus on the achievement of the students. And there's a reference to the Harlem Zone conflict. Well, the, the Harlem Trojan Zone model, which um, a group of Pittsburghers are exploring for the possibilities of adaptation to the East End, is a wonderful model. It is just hugely expensive. Um, I mean, it is a totally wonderful model. It's a soup to nuts family um, support, student support model. Um, it, can, it starts pre-birth. Um, mothers are given programming even before they have birth. Um, the Children's Zone is staffed to the point where there are people to go to people's apartments if they don't come for their classes. Um, it is a very, very wonderful but hugely expensive model. Um, at the moment, given our uh, need to raise $250 million for the Pittsburgh Promise, um, we have $110 million to go. It may be beyond our reach. Um, but the whole issue of why not just put more resources into a low-performing school rather than close it just begs the question of then what would you close? Because you have to close something. Um, so the supposition then would be would you take a more achieving school and close it instead? And you just have to ask why and what would be your reasons. And there might be some reasons that lower achieving school may be in a fantastic building that doesn't um, need much money over the um, long haul. And there could be an argument made for that. But I think it's one of those issues that would be a threshold to overcome. And it can be overcome, but if you have an under, if you have two things at the same time, a very under-enrolled school and very low performance in that school. If you're playing baseball, it's kind of two strikes in that situation. Okay. Does a person who ask, is, do you have a follow-up to your question? No. Okay. <clears throat> I, these are all out of order now, so I'm just going to start randomly picking these. Um, Question is, if a building that if a building that remains open was renovated recently enough that the project does not qualify for reimbursement by the state or some for some of the expenses, will the renovations be delayed? I think I got it, Mark. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll take the question. I'll take that one. If you look at the um, when the draft budget is released next week. What we do, well, let's step back. Uh, the state reimburses projects in, um, in a program called Plan Talk, and roughly once every 20 years. And it excludes you can renovate a building and receive some state money. Excluded are athletic uh, amenities, excluded are administrative facilities or warehouses, and things like that. So it's really for schools. Um, and it's based upon uh, your need uh, from a capacity standpoint. Um, and you have to do uh, so much of the building to qualify. You're allowed to do projects over a three-year period, max. Um, so what, what we've done to answer that question is to take a look at the needs. Uh, for instance, uh, there, uh, Mr. Roosevelt spoke about Langley needing a roof. Uh, Langley's roof was rated uh, poor uh, in this study. It's been on the books to have a roof replacement. Because we know that that's an investment that'll be about a million and two, uh, 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 one million two hundred thousand dollars we look at the building additionally. Uh, we know that the interior finishes uh, require work. Paint, uh, there's carpet in the hallways. If anyone's here from Langley, you know the carpet. Um, some interior lighting <laughs> in the hallways, and then unit vents. Um, we've replaced part of the uh, heating plant over time, and, and then perhaps a geothermal project. So what, what we did uh, in looking at the planning was uh, perhaps uh, instead of just doing the roof, we're going to try to do all those projects and get a little bit of money back on reimbursement. So the short answer to that well, no, as with a long question, uh, and a long answer, is that your most efficient means of doing projects is to do a building well once in 20 years. So we're going to try to do a, a much better job of that uh, in the Pittsburgh schools. Uh, some of the projects in the seven-year plan when it's released, uh, you'll see is a, a renovation of Northview uh, that will add air conditioning for your geothermal system, and, and Langley, for instance, as I just spoke to.
The next question is, growing K through 8 kills the middle schools, a slow, painful death. How will you keep them alive to the end in the middle schools, unlike Shelley today and next year? Phasing out of school is not a cool thing. <clears throat> it's perhaps only better than the alternative of just excising. And um, no one, if you just look all across the country, especially on high schools, has found a happy or moderately happy way of closing a high school. Um, it really is very difficult. If you think about phasing it out, it's very hard. If you think about a school that's already under-enrolled, and then it has, doesn't have a ninth grade, and then it has a, doesn't have a tenth grade, you're the last group of 11th and 12th graders in the building, it's, it's tough. Um, the choice, of course, is closing it all at once, which means those kids who have an identity with their high school have to transfer to another high school that they may not have any feelings of affinity for. And in fact, in some cases, if you're crossing neighborhood lines, they may have some feelings of non-affinity for. So it's, you know, this is hard. So on the middle school question, you know, I'm as very, very focused on achievement data. Um, the most successful thing we did four years ago was close the comprehensive middle schools. Um, our best results now, by far, in this district are in eighth grade. Um, that breaks a trend of urban districts where mostly your best results are third grade, and it's just a descending graph until you hit rock bottom in 11. <coughs> We're now third grade, little dip, quite a bit of escalation in eighth grade and then decline to 11. So um, there's a lot of evidence that K-8s and 6-12s are just better for kids. One transition. You go K-5, 6-12. You go K-8, 9-12. One transition. Now some kids will still do K-5, 6-8, and 9-12. And we will keep open middle schools that parents and families are showing us by choosing them, they want and that are succeeding. And we do have some of those. Uh, Pittsburgh Classical, Sterrett, um, there are others I don't please, because I didn't mention it, doesn't mean it's not on the, on, on the list. It just, those came to my mind. Um, so we will examine that carefully. We don't have very many comprehensive medals left. Probably South Hills is the largest, I think. And as you know, that's kind of a <laughs> campus with Brashear. So it's, um, it's different, it could be more different under some circumstances. I hope that answered that. I think there were several prompts to that question. Yeah. Do you have a follow-up, follow if that was your question? Yeah. There are two questions sort of on the same subject, so I'm going to combine them and hopefully not mess up anybody's question. Um, but one question is, why not close or relocate a school like Roosevelt that has no parking lot for staff or parents, no drop-off area or playground or play fields? And then there's another question that refers to uh, the availability of safe parking and um, the ability of, of parents or guardians to get to the school be a factor in the decision. Sure. Um, as for closing Roosevelt, um, the, the main part of Roosevelt, I believe, is a pretty new building. Um, the older part of Roosevelt, which now has kindergarten and first grade, is an older building, and I think they did recommend yes. during the young study um, closing that. Um, I don't know. I remember earlier in my time here looking at that part of the city and looking for alternative locations, and there weren't many. Um, so. Um, I think what is being suggested here, and we have not, again, delved into its uh, practicality, would be closing the older part of Roosevelt, but certainly maintaining the newer part of Roosevelt. Plus, it's a, it's a very well-named school.
our our rental of the concord space is during the renovation i think uh, with the young plan envisions i think actually this even goes much earlier than the young plan the uh, addition at concord is in part designed to uh, to bring some of the pre-k uh, from the old annex building at, at roosevelt into concord um, so that'll alleviate it. it's not that all the staff that these two buildings will have to work out of the Roosevelt building. Part of that is into the Concord facility. Yeah. Yeah, and I would tell you that in instances where uh, the, the needs of the neighborhood and the needs of the school around parking uh, have required us to, to pick up a small lease. We do that at Arsenal. Uh, we do Arsenal. Uh, we obviously do it at Kappa. Uh, we rent surface, uh, part of the surface lot at Kappa and Conroy as well. Uh, uh, Arsenal and uh, the neighbors around Arsenal and Conroy have gone to permit parking, which is necessitated. Our move to do that. So we would take a look at, at doing that uh, if it would become a, an issue with the neighborhood. Okay, can we go on to? I have a general question. Uh, can we can we can you write it down for me, Terry? If, if I told you we were looking to acquire surface lot, uh, no, no, that's awfully expensive. And the honest answer to your question is that when you think of building and site configuration um, in, an, in an urban setting, we, we have a, really a wide variety. We have some campuses where we have acreage. This is an example. You're sitting on about 13 acres of green, you know, partial green space. We, we can park till the cows come home. So you have a lot of outdoor. You have that at Brashear, you have that at Greenway. Um, boy, at the same time, some of the schools where we have almost no parking, uh, New Roosevelt, Concord, Kappa, there's some of the choices that are most popular for parents. Colfax is another example. There's, there's almost no parking. So the, the, the absence of parking in and of itself has not been a deterrent to having a successful school. It, I think in a more perfect world where um, you know, I mean, if you wanted to keep your construction costs down in a more perfect world, you could build everything flat and spread out. Um, the city, we're, we're pretty landlocked. Um, and so the honest answer is, you, you make what you, you make the best out of what you have. Um, and I, I don't have an elegant solution for you at Kappa. Your trade-off is you're, you're in the middle of the arts district in, in, in the absolute best facility that, that this school district owns. Okay, um, the next question we have is, while many schools are experiencing enrollment decline, some schools have experienced con consistent growth. Will we be looking at all feeder patterns to make sure that some schools do not experience over-enrollment? Well, um, if you look at a map of feeder patterns in the city, um, and you might want to entertain yourself by doing so, it is a very weird looking map. And I've only been here four years, but I've been here long enough to know that a lot of politics went into creation of that map. But once, I'm, I'm just going to say why we're reluctant to make too many changes in feeder patterns. A lot of people have made home decisions based on the feeder pattern in which their home resides. So you would certainly have a lot of people saying, hey, wait a minute, I moved into that home understanding that that was my feeder pattern. So, we will look at feeder patterns, and again, the map is, is confusing, and probably those of you who know more history than I, I mean, 
you look at Mike Alderdice's theater pattern, and, and it's got some very, the East Hills, East Hills kids hop over, I think, two different schools to be assigned to Alderdice. I know there's a historical reason for that. Um, I believe families in Hazelwood have a choice between Brashear and Alderdice. I'm sure there's a historical reason for that. Um, and I'm sure these historical reasons have a lot of energy behind them. So we will be looking at feeder patterns, but we will be you know, careful um, as we e examine them and, and may propose some changes in them. And it would be the kind of situation that the question implied that might cause you to do it. If you do have a school that is over-enrolled and very successful, you might, you might, here might, might, I said might three times, look at slicing off some of its feeder pattern, but how would you feel if you were in the feeder pattern part that was being sliced off, right? You might feel pretty aggrieved and you might want to wonder why that part of the feeder pattern was sliced off rather than some other part of the feeder pattern was sliced off. So I think it will be a very delicate process if we go into that. Follow up to that question? No? Okay, sorry. Um, that was my question. It's kind of based on my experience with my kids at one school at Colfax that's intended to be a three-round school and is now four rounds through fourth grade, will be five rounds through, or four rounds through fifth grade. The first grade class is almost five rounds and based on um, talking to people in the community, it's very possible that the sixth grade will be four rounds. Um, when I bought my house, Colfax was like not a good school. So, and I would probably be someone cut out, I think, based on geography. But I think it makes a lot of sense to tackle this issue before it becomes a crisis, because this has been you know, continual for, for several years. And I just want to make sure that it's on the radar and that we do it before we have more drownables in the parking lot. I don't disagree with you, Kate. I just, I just want to acknowledge the delicacy of it and how you could be affecting people who have made very significant decisions about their own families and their and their homes. So <clears throat> yes, there may be a couple of instances where it needs to be done, but it will be um, a very difficult challenge once it gets there. The next question. How does the facility studies translate to reconfiguring from pre-K to 8 to pre-K to 5, especially in a school with strong programmatic theme? And then um, the second oh, question. Oh, well, okay. I, I'll, there's a second question on here. I think that's a Montessori specific question. Yes, that's the second question. Um, <clears throat> Why are the preschoolers counting? Can you answer that part and I'll take the rest, Christine? Was it? Well, um, Pre-K, if you look at the first line, is counted in our grand total of enrollment. We've been allowed to do that by the state for about four years now. So our total enrollment last year was 28.2. Uh, our K-12 was 26 cents. So when started, Montessori was looked at, and its population was analyzed, was the pre-K taken into account? Well, you're answering the other part, I'll pick up the answer. Okay. You know the answer to the other part. Um, this issue around how to best utilize the Montessori facility to enable the Montessori program to be as strong as possible has people on all sides, which is going to happen, folks, with most of these issues. Um, there are those, um, like the report, uh, did recommend returning it to a K-5 um, because they thought that the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade um, was less, I guess, I'm actually now thinking for the, which I shouldn't do, but was less essential to the ongoing success of the program than being able to have um, a, an expanded, slightly expanded uh, pre-K-5 program would be my guess. Um, you know, some people came to the public hearing, which is, of course, always one way to communicate. Um, the other way to communicate on issues like this, because we were asked to think about that, is, um, you know, a real survey of the Montessori community. Um, because I've certainly heard by email, um, which is a lovely thing, as you know, email, um, from people on both sides of this. So I think in this case, one of the things that would be helpful 
is to get as clear a sense of the community's desires as possible. Were you able to discover the answer? There are two classrooms. I, I think it's important to note that the, I don't think the configuration recommendation on Montessori was driven by pre-K or not pre-K. It was driven by the low enrollments in the six to eight grades. I think the uh, I think the issue is that it's their their head start they're not head start so we can't count them. Go ahead. Neither the uh, pre K at Montessori they're not run through the head start and or kind of be able literally block grant they're at because of their unique na unique nature and we're counting. I think that might have just been a, uh, a possible oversight in how they were treating those two classrooms. But as Chris stated, their recommendation would have been related to the upper grades. This is an area, by the way, because we were asked again, how can parents help? Both help for their own interests and for the school district's prosperity. Prosperity. You know, you probably have an opinion on this, one way or the other, um, or you may not. But it really would help us. It's not as if you're going to get unanimity on this issue or on any other of these issues. But, um, and again, last time, for instance, in the Hill District, we went through the Hill District tried to get together and make recommendations, and, and they did. And they had community meetings, and then they came forward with a recommendation that we were told, like, pretty much everybody was behind. And then as soon as that recommendation came out, of course, then the people who didn't like that one came out. People generally don't come out in support of a change. They generally come out in opposition. So sometimes what might happen to us is we may think, oh, that community has spoken very clearly. They want X. And then you say, all right, we're going to do X. But then the people who don't like X come out. So the most help you can give us is to really try, as fairly and without biasing it yourself as possible, to find out what the community does want. Now, there are going to be many situations in which it comes out kind of 50-50 or 60-40 one way or the other, and we're still going to be left with a very hard Decision, but there may be many situations in which a compromise can be worked out that all people can support. Um, I don't know what it would be in this case, but um, so that's really where we can all do each other some mutual benefit if possible. There, there are a couple questions that deal basically with the same issue, so I'm going to try to combine them. This question says, uh, when closing some of these schools, has anyone looked at the neighborhoods that are being merged? In some cases, it could, it could be deter detrimental to the learning environment. And, it, and a second similar question basically says, is the board prepared to deal with neighborhood reprisals with combined schools? Well, I mean, if you had to pick kind of the toughest thing to wrestle with, that question is the toughest to wrestle with. Um, and um, it's an interesting question, and obviously I'm not a Pittsburgher. I'm not as aware of some of the turf and rivalry issues as others might be, and we do have to take them into account. We should take them into account, we have to. However, even if there are rivalries, you just can't continue. I mean, sometimes if you listen to some people, and I don't mean this too aggressively, you almost have to have a school on every block because you know the kids around that block don't get along. Sometimes, just sometimes, this is adults putting some of their own stuff on kids. Sometimes it's very real. Now, you know, let's just take a couple of situations and, and be specific. Here on the east side, we have Peabody and we have Westinghouse. Uh, we can't continue to run to 912 high schools. Peabody and Westinghouse. The numbers aren't there. They're not even close to them. So it's not, that's not a close call situation. Now, of course, when we have met with folks from the Peabody community, uh, many of them, not all of them, but many of them make it clear they don't want their child assigned to Westinghouse. Now, of course, we are moving to much more of a choice situation in high school. So if Peabody were to close, for example, as a 9-12 school, the parents and families would have more choices than Westinghouse. 
Westinghouse would likely be one of their choices. But then we're faced with a situation if, if Peabody, for example, were to close, and very few of the kids were to choose to go to Westinghouse, we still have a hugely under-enrolled Westinghouse. So then the question becomes, how do you continue to utilize Westinghouse? You know, as you know, some people in the community are working on a 612 plan. Some people in the community, I, I can see head shaking. I'm just telling you what I hear. But you, but but we can't run both Peabody at 400 and 450 students at Westinghouse at 320. It, it can't happen. So what should happen? I don't pretend to have the answer to that. Um, but I do know something has to happen. And I do know that we're going to need input from folks. But the, if, if, the, if the prescribed solution is you can't do anything, that's not viable. That's just not viable. We have to. Um, and by the way, when you interview the kids a lot um, at Oliver or at Peabody and Racing House, where they're, they are very frustrated with the lack of um, extracurriculars and full-scale offerings that they can experience because they're so under control. So it's a complicated issue, and we're going to need lots of help and advice on the Westinghouse issue has been going on now for a number of years. And there's very, very strong feelings on many sides of it. Um, there are folks in the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade at Lincoln that come to me and say, look, Mr. Roosevelt, I don't care what you say, what you do, my kids aren't going to Westinghouse. And then there are other people that say, we want a viable Westinghouse, we want a 612 Westinghouse, and therefore we want that to be the 612 in that part of the city. We're going to have to work that out. We don't pretend um, to have the best answer. The only thing we know is there has to be a answer. If I could add something, Mr. Roosevelt, to that. I think keep in mind this summer, um, as part of the Ninth Grade Nation, for, uh, we had a Camp Guy Suite experience for ninth graders. Um, all of our Langley students, incoming all of our Langley students participated on the same day. Incoming Peabody and Westinghouse students participated on the same day. Um, we have students from different neighborhoods who, uh, some of the schools are so small that we're participating in athletics um, together. And actually the, the programs here uh, run that way. So we have, we do have some viable examples in the school district. The Gifted Center is an example. Kids from all over the district uh, come together on different days of the week. So there are models where it is possible to bring kids together from different neighborhoods. Yeah, I would to One, uh, following up to what you said, Mr. Burdi, those are probably the children who are willing to participate in that, but you're leaving out the kids who don't want to participate in that, and that's where it becomes detrimental. The second thing is, when you start doing this, you, you come up with a chain reaction with the bullying, which we're trying to prevent, and then you also have the dropout rate. Because now, as parents, we got to contend with trying to send this kid to school who does not want to go there for either territorial reasons or bullying reasons. So now it's back on us, and we're trying to get them an education, but we need the help from the school district. And when you say to me right now we don't have an answer, we need to find answers before we close these schools. We do, um, and we need to do it collectively. And that's that's one of our messages. You got to help us figure out what the best solution is. Okay. All right. I mean, we welcome that very much. Okay. Um Next question is, in academic terms, what input do you want from parents? Yes. Um, does, does anybody mind acknowledging that they're the author of that question? What do you, what do you mean by that? <coughs> if, if my school uh, may close, I, I would like to figure out what it shouldn't close, especially if it's doing well academically. What kind of information? I mean, you have some information, but we as parents have other type of information about the schools that may change your mind about the specific 
closing of a specific school? Well, um, I have noticed over time that most parents in schools that are being considered for closing do not think that they should close. So one of the things I would urge folks just to consider is that just like coming to the public hearing and saying my school shouldn't close is not the most helpful communication techniques. You're right. Why? So that question, um, um, I mean last time, which we won't be going through again, we came out with a plan. We had about two months of additional public input opportunity, then we changed the plan somewhat, and it went forward. And that was because of a lot of input. Um, you know, I don't think there's any sort of secret as to what most powerful input would be. Um, many people during the last round said, well, you don't understand. The school, yes, we admit it, the results have not been good, but they're great now, and you'll see that when the next scores come out. Or they would say, well, you don't understand, Mr. Roosevelt, there's this housing complex being built up there, and there's going to be 120 new kids in our school um, within the next 18 months. You know, those things we can check out, um, we can look at, and attempt to verify, and, and they would be helpful. And particularly this time, folks, we have lots of, well, not lots, but we have enough time to make those kind of um, decisions. And, Decisions the city makes impact us enormously. The closing of the, the um, some of the housing around Fort Pitt last year reduced the Fort Pitt population um, uh, pretty considerably. St. Clair Village closing is affecting um, different populations. So if people are privy to information, either about some academic vibrancy that doesn't come out in the hard numbers or about some aspects of the neighborhood change that we might not be aware of, we're, we're very open to it. But the more specific, the better. And that, I think, is always the case. Okay. Um, the next question is, are the changes we are experiencing as a result of the Supreme Court ruling that segregation can no longer be based upon race, knowing that our existing mega programs are based on race, would changes be necessary? Um, no, that doesn't really impact this. Um, for those of you who didn't hear the question or know it, the Supreme Court ruled in their Seattle decision that race cannot be the basis for school assignments, which is a significant reversal of Supreme Court decisions from 20 years previously. We have had to change our magnet policy, which used to just be that people applying for magnets would be put in one group, African American, and the other group, white, and you would take one from one group and one from the other, and that is no longer legally permissible. Um, so we have changed that policy. But actually, in most instances within the district, that policy wasn't um, effectuating very many decisions as it was. So it didn't result in, in any particularly significant change in the populations of our magnet schools. In fact, interestingly, some of the people who thought the policy, it was African Americans that were very worried that the policy would affect, but I think what some people haven't realized is most of our magnets are now more than half African American. And therefore, actually, the policy is making it harder for African Americans to get into the magnets rather than easier. So it, it, its net effect has not been um, particularly significant. <coughs> The next question is, uh, once renovations are complete, will all buildings be, school buildings, be 100% handicapped accessible? That's an end game that will happen over time. Um, if, you, um, if you look at uh, just the seven year plan, you see a number of ADA uh, projects. In fact, uh, when you, above a, when you do your plan on projects and above a certain percentage, 20, about 20% 20 of the at least 20% of the project has to be spent on accessibility. Um, I, I think it's a fair shot to say that we'll be a, a lot more accessible in 10 years than we are today. Um, I don't know if that hits every elevator in every building. Uh, I think part of that art will be um, trying to make sure that you figure out which buildings will come offline so you make the best accessibility investments that, that you can to serve the population that you have left. Uh, the answer is 
possibly, but there would be no guarantee. Terry, what's your call? Uh, I can tell you that it's a long journey, and in, in each year's capital plan, you see accessibility enhancements, uh, trying to tackle um, additional schools every year. It is a priority in our capital budget. If I if I could just note on that, um, you know, when Chris was doing very quickly running through his slides, um, I, I just wanted to because one of the processes we're asked to do is help us live in each other's shoes. Um, I got here four years ago and we spent $520 million a year. We spend $520 million a year now. Um, the preceding six years before that, the budget went up $20 million a year, or $120 million. That is what got us into near bankruptcy and near state takeover. We can't do that. So one of our burdens is we need to keep this budget under control. Period. No choice, no discussion. And so all decisions like this need to be carefully balanced against competing interests. And it's very difficult. And our um, debt for construction projects is about 12%. Debt services will be a little bit more than 11% of the 2010 budget. See, I'm a layman, so about 12% qualifies. Uh, Mr. Burden, our chief financial officer, would have to say a little over 11%. But that's pretty much about where you want it to stop. Because, you know, if the debt eats up more, then there's less for children. So this is this is always a balancing act. The next there's two questions that deal um, with the sports programs. Um, first does if you would consider um, setting up a task force including parents on how to enhance interscholastic sports programs given the new school alignments, and then when schools are made to 6 through 12, what happens to the teams? Do they both have to practice at the same time? That type of thing. Well, um, sports, so yes, so the first question, yes, we probably are going to, as you may know, we've been undergoing a review for gender equity um, because there were some issues raised that seemed legitimate, to be honest around the equity of our sports programs for girls and boys. So that review is being conducted. And when it's completed, we probably will convene a group of parents and other people to look overall at our sports program. Uh, I don't think we're utilizing sports as effectively as we can on a number of different levels. One is student engagement. Two is promise readiness. Um, in all of our sports programs, we should communicate to kids what they need to do in order to be successful students. So we're gonna be trying to do a much better job of bringing all of these things into play together. As to the 612 question, Chris, do you have a? I, I, I can give you a, a concrete example of a growing pain that might actually be the genesis of that. And I, I think it's in this, uh, in this facility um, where we have multiple, um, you know, multiple grade levels. And because of the renovations, it, 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 the students at Frick are actually playing on, on the uh, Shemi, uh, playing with the Shemi and Prep kids. Once the renovations at Frick are done, that gym will be available. We'll be able to pull all the time uh, the shared use, uh, the, the shared use is necessary. It, the, the scheduling is a challenge, um, and, and it is something that has to be worked through and thought through. I think the, the genesis of that question is an inconvenience caused by the next phase of the side tech renovation. Because the gym right now, um, in terms of, of games and, and after school use is off limits uh, construction. That was two people's questions. I had a person, is that your question? Do you want to follow up? That's come along with my question. And the reason why I asked that question is because I coach. I coach girls basketball here. Um, well, at the Frick, well, we don't have a name yet. But, um, we, the Shelley team, it's boys and girls middle school season and also boys and girls high school season. And so there were four teams trying to work in one gym at one time, and it's just not feasible. I also coach boys volleyball, which there's the, it's the girls um, high school season and the girls and boys middle school season. And it's 
you know, it's becoming a problem because then, you know, the middle school has to be out of here by five. You know, and then you have the girls who, the girls high school who can't practice, and then the boys, you know, high school, so it, it becomes a problem. And then also, like, there's a game scheduled in January where the boy, the high school boys are scheduled to play at 3.15, and we're scheduled to play at 3.30. I mean, we're good, but. Uh. I, I can, if you don't mind, I'll share the specific okay. workaround uh, okay. that, that we uh, were working with Principal Fakaris today. The uh, closed Lechi facility, the, the building that cheers the mechanical systems with Connolly has a high school gym, a practice quality gym. Uh, and she was gonna arrange for some coaches to go visit that. Uh, we already, obviously we're heating Connolly, because we have some staff, we have some student programs there. And if you heat Connolly, you're heating Lechi uh, because they share the systems. We have custodial coverage there until the, like six o'clock in the evening. So we're gonna, we will make that practice time work. We'll get around that that problem. Once the fridge is available, we should be good. Thank you. Was that your fault? Yeah. Um, I have a first question. Okay. Um, some of the some of the ideas that some of the ideas that parents might have in regard to the sports program might have an impact on the negotiations, on the labor negotiations. And therefore, the timing of this might be more critical than just waiting until the gender equity study is done. Um, parents have brought up previously some of the things that might have to do with the contract, because when we brought it up before, it was already on the table, and we were told nothing could be changed. And now we don't know if everything's on the table again and nothing can be changed, or you know where you stand because you have to negotiate the teacher effectiveness grant and everything else. So I think that this is a sooner rather than later proposition. And the other thing is, if this really does happen, um, it would be important to bring parents in on this and um, publicize it so that parents have the opportunity to participate in this. Yeah, I would say that if people have. And I think I'm probably familiar with the recommendations that relate to collective bargaining, but if you do have strong opinions on that, I would get them in for Mark sooner rather than later, you're right. Um, will this collective bargaining agreement have an opportunity to address such things? I don't know. I don't know. Um, one of the things that we're going to have to do in this collective bargaining agreement is limit the breadth of discussion because the things under the teacher effectiveness plan that have to be discussed are momentous. So I, I can't, I don't know yet. Okay, um, the, the, there's a series of questions dealing with the teacher center and, a, and some specific schools. I'm gonna ask the specific questions, but there's probably three or four questions on that topic, so if folks have those, maybe we can just run through them, and then if there's a general follow-up, we can do it that way, if that's okay with everybody? Um, the first one is, um, will Langley be big enough to hold all of the students that may be coming from the north side? And um, how will that affect the quality of teaching? And then it gets to the teacher, whether or not it's going to be used as the teacher center. And there's like three questions about what's going to be used for the teacher center. Um, the prospective sites for the teacher center are um, not that many. Um, we have committed that it will not be a high achieving school because it will be a great opportunity um, for the students that are there, and therefore we should offer it to programs and students who have not been afforded uh, as much as they should have been. So you can pretty much narrow that down yourself. Um, it means that um, Oliver and Langley are some combination of the two is one potential site. Um, the East End is one potential site. Um, and that's probably about it for the high school branch. Uh, we will probably start with the Teachers Academy at a high school first, because high school is where our achievement numbers have not um, moved. Um, so this is a September 2011 action that we are talking about. Um, so we still have planning time, but um, it needs to be a pretty large um, school because the point is that all your incoming teachers are coming there to work under uh, master teachers. So 